Hello and welcome everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous et toutes. My name is Courtney Amo and I'm an executive faculty member at the Canada School of Public Service. I will be your host today. Thank you for being with us. I would like to start by acknowledging that since I'm joining you from Moncton, New Brunswick, the land on which I live and work is the traditional unceded territory of the Wolastukiyik or Maliseet and Mi'kmaq peoples. I recognize that we all work in different places and therefore we may be working in a different indigenous traditional territory. I encourage you to take a moment to think about this. To make your viewing experience better, we encourage you to disconnect from the VPN if possible and reconnect to the event. Please note also that we have simultaneous interpretation and CART services available to you for this event in both official languages. Please refer to the reminder email you receive from the school or visit the VExpo to learn how to access these features. We'll be taking questions throughout the event via the collaborative video chat platform. To submit your questions, click on the bubble icon at the top right hand of your screen. You won't see your question appear in the chat, but the moderator will be receiving them. We'll get to as many as time will permit today. We encourage you to participate in the language of your choice. Nous vous encourageons à participer dans la langue de votre choix. The Canada School of Public Service is pleased to host this session, which is part of the hybrid workplace series for those who are working or transitioning to a hybrid work environment. Today's session is also co-hosted with the National Managers Community as part of the NMC Virtual Symposium. This symposium is one of the ways that we create opportunities for managers and aspiring managers across Canada to connect, engage, and learn about topics that are important to them. As an active, horizontal, 20-year-old community that connects managers with leaders, we are pleased to let you know that the Clerk of the Privy Council has recorded a special video message for public service managers. We invite you to take the time to listen to her message in the Symposium Digital V Expo and explore the other resources that are there. On top of what you will gain from today's Best Practices for Managers event, we have other events coming up. As part of the Hybrid Workplace series, on November 30th, we will have an event on improving ergonomics for a hybrid workplace. This event will feature a panel of occupational health and safety experts who will share their insights about modern ergonomic principles and strategies to improve the hybrid workplace. And as part of the National Managers Community Symposium, tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we have a session on vulnerable leadership and how to have compassionate conversations. Then at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we are also excited to offer our keynote presentation on how to handle microaggressions in the workplace with Camille Dundas, co-founder and editor-in-chief of buyblacks.com. In addition to the school's numerous on-point offerings in the coming months, the National Managers Community has scheduled in-person regional learning days for managers between November 14th and December 6th, the first since before the pandemic. We invite you to monitor our websites and register for the NMCs and the school's newsletters to receive the latest updates. Now that you have an understanding of what is to come, let's get started with this great panel about best practices for managers in a hybrid workplace. So today we will hear from fantastic speakers from the Federal Public Service who will share valuable lessons based on their recent experimentation with the hybrid workplace model, including insights that can be utilized when managing a hybrid team. This timely conversation follows yesterday's insightful presentation, Management Competencies in the Hybrid Workplace by Dr. Wayne Corneal. If you were unable to participate in yesterday's presentation, it will also be made available to you after this session. So now let me introduce you to our panelists. 
Uttara Chauhan is the Director General of the Future of Work Secretariat, Employment and Social Development Canada. Uttara's work in the federal public service has focused on socioeconomic policy and program development in the areas of labor market and social development, immigration, Indigenous affairs, and civic engagement. Prior to joining the federal public service, Uttara worked as an independent consultant in international development. She is also a published novelist and a movie lover. Jason Fox is director of the Research and Strategy Office of the Chief Human Resources Officer, Treasury Board Secretariat. Jason has 20 years of experience as a public servant in various HR disciplines. He began as a learning advisor at the Department of National Defense and has worked as senior advisor at the Privy Council Office as part of the Public Service Renewal Secretariat. He also worked as director of human capital strategies at the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. As mentioned, he's currently director of research and strategy at the Office of the Chief Human Resources uh, Officer in the research planning and renewal sector. And Jason is also a professional coach. Caroline Desrochers est directrice avec le groupe de travail des sous-ministres sur l'avenir du travail aux Affaires mondiales Canada. Caroline compte près d'une vingtaine d'années au sein de la fonction publique. Elle mène actuellement un groupe de travail sur l'avenir du travail afin de mettre en œuvre un cadre pour un modèle de travail hybride au sein d'Affaires mondiales Canada, une organisation qui compte près de 13 000 employés. Caroline était jusqu'à récemment directrice des affaires politiques et culturelles auprès du Consulat général du Canada à New York. Elle a travaillé pendant huit ans à développer les relations entre le Canada et les États-Unis, incluant sur les questions économiques et de politique commerciale. Elle a également travaillé de près avec la communauté financière pour faire avancer l'égalité des femmes dans le monde des affaires. Alors, bienvenue à vous toutes. It was welcome to our esteemed panelists. So as mentioned earlier, you are invited to submit your questions for our panelists, but to get us started, I have a, a few questions um, for each of our panelists. So Uttara, I would love to start with you. Having to manage employees from, from various work sites can be overwhelming, and it can require managers to possess a new set of leadership norms and, and behaviors to successfully manage a hybrid team. Could you share with us some of your insights on these new leadership norms and behaviors and provide us with examples of best practices that are being used at Employment and Social Development Canada? Bien sûr. Merci beaucoup, Courtney. Et merci à Isabelle et Laura et les autres à l'école de la fonction publique du Canada et la communauté des gestionnaires qui ont travaillé très, très dur pour organiser cet événement. Je suis très heureuse d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Ça me fait plaisir de partager le travail que nous avons fait ici à Emploi et Développement Social Canada. With our workforce and workplaces undergoing profound change, you as leaders are going to play an even bigger role to successfully manage this change. A new way of working will require a new way of leading. At ESDC, we started implementation of our flexible model, flexible work model in early September after 18 months of analysis and design and experimentation. In our model, depending on job function, some employees work on site, some work predominantly off site, and others work in a hybrid model. One of the first foundational tools we developed to support our leaders was a playbook on leadership norms and behaviors for a flexible work model. It is based on the latest research and extensive consultations with employees and leaders across the department. We have shared the playbook with the organizers today, and I encourage you all to check it out. We expect leaders at all levels, from supervisors to deputy ministers, to demonstrate these norms. 
To make this expectation real and concrete, we have already included these norms in the corporate performance commitments of all executives in our department starting this year. The playbook describes four norms and provides examples of effective and ineffective behaviors for each one. The first norm is intentional leadership. Intentional leaders are purposeful in their approaches and thoughtful in how they act. In our new work context, you will need to act and communicate very clearly and regularly with all your team members, whether on-site, off-site, or hybrid, to ensure that they feel included and are aware of what is expected of them. To manage a hybrid team that comes on-site periodically, you will need to be very intentional about thinking and planning your on-site days so that your team is maximizing their time together and getting the most out of in-person connections. The second norm is a growth mindset combined with psychological safety. These are two interrelated, interrelated concepts that are critical in supporting a culture of learning, risk-taking, and innovation. You will need to be wide open to the possibilities that can be generated by encouraging staff to express new ideas and views on how to implement hybrid work in an iterative manner. Be open to learning through trial and error. A psychologically safe environment is one where leaders see mistakes as opportunities to learn and are open to sharing their struggles with their team. Building trust is the third norm. This is not a new concept, but it is fundamentally different in a flexible work model, since interactions are often mediated by technology. And as leaders, you may, not, may no longer engage in person with your teams on a regular basis. Building trust may take more time and effort when people are not interacting in person focusing on outcomes and results rather than hours spent online will help you build trust in managing hybrid teams. Finally, the fourth norm is empathy-based management and a sense of belonging. To help your employees navigate change, you need to know and understand each member of your team and what they bring to the workplace. Leading with empathy means making meaningful connections with people, understanding personal circumstances, and finding ways to cultivate informal interactions, both virtually and in person. Maintaining a sense of belonging with the organization and learning its culture has become critical now that teams do not gather and see e each other in person as much as they did before. This is especially important for younger hires and new public servants. Certains d'entre vous peuvent entendre cela aujourd'hui et se sentir dépassés. Vous vous dites peut-être, mon assiette est déjà pleine. Ai-je vraiment besoin d'en de, rajouter? Mon conseil pour vous, gardez un esprit ouvert. Sound leadership practices should never be a burden to a leader and will only operate how a team will only improve how a team operates and it will improve the results we deliver for Canadians. Embracing these norms will require an investment of time and effort, no doubt. It won't be an easy task, but we believe the results will be infinitely rewarding. Thank you for listening. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Uthra for this overview. What, what strikes me is that, as you mentioned, these are sound leadership principles and they've always been important, but this new context requires us to, to really double down on them and to try things and to experiment and see what works. And so I really appreciate the, the growth mindset, the, psycho, uh, the psychological safety element allowing ourselves to, to try out what is gonna work best to ensure that everyone feels like they're part of something larger, 
that their contributions are meaningful, um, that they feel aligned with the rest of the organization and are able to bring their best work forward. I'm sure that we will be receiving questions for further clarification on this model, but I appreciate you giving us the summary. Just on the topic of experimentation, Jason, I know from your perspective, you've been receiving a lot of the information about what departments are trying, what they're experimenting with in terms of hybrid workplace models. And I'm wondering if you can share some of what you're seeing and hearing in terms of what departments are learning uh, through their experimentations, what might be some promising practices, concrete tips and tricks for managers and aspiring managers so that they can start to explore and try different ways of managing in this hybrid environment. Thank you for the, the question. So um, I'm glad to speak about this today. Um, I wanted to start with maybe framing it a little bit in terms of lessons, because during the pandemic, we did um, experience a lot of um, upheaval and changes. And really, we, as we were preparing for an experiment and experimentation phase, we did um, highlight a few lessons as part of that process. So I just wanted to re take this opportunity to reiterate them. And those were things like not one size fits all. So really, this is a, a multivariant problem that uh, we're all trying to um, organize together and that, um, you know, in our experience, we have not seen one particular solution be adequate for every single situ uh, situation. So that was one lesson we brought into our experimentation planning. Uh, the second is that hybrid is, is uh, working in hybrid is not the same as working remote by default or everyone in the office. It's something in between and that it might take a while to get to a state of equilibrium. Um, at the same time, it's also a gateway or an opportunity to explore more, uh, you know, other things such as, you know, how we organize work, how we, uh, you know, how we um, organize teams and how we manage our, our resources and interact with colleagues. Ensuite, um, un autre élément qu'on qu a mis à l'appui dans nos, dans nos démarches, c'est que uh, les façons hybrides sont différentes pour chacun. Uh, par rapport où vous êtes dans la structure ou dans l'organisation. Donc, une personne qui est, dans, qui est un cadre ou un gestionnaire ou un employé uh, dans la région de la capitale nationale ou dans une région, votre expérience sera uh, différente uh, dans tous ces contextes-là. Vous allez avoir des rôles différents. Donc, you know, hybrid looks different depending where you are sitting in the organization. Ensuite, il faut admettre qu'on ne connaît pas toutes les réponses. Alors, il nous manque des données. On ne connaît pas toutes les situations et, et on est comme euh, en train d'améliorer de, 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 notre capacité de, de, de faire les recherches, d'observer et de planifier des, euh, la collecte de données. Et puis, la dernière chose que je dirais, c'est qu'on est dans une situation où c'est plus une évolution qu'un qu un, qu un résultat concret. So, it's more of an evolution than an end state. So, it's really to embrace that opportunity. Um, that's why, in, in terms of our team, what we've been working on at the moment is a, a project called Hybrid in a Box, which is um, one of the first enterprise-wide or government-wide uh, projects, which is a, uh, what we've done is partnered with 11 departments who were, had the readiness or the, the inclination to partner with us to establish a central baseline evaluation for hybrid models. I think there's, you know, somewhere between seven and eight models being uh, looked at at different places and different organizations. So the number is not important, but it's the variety that's important. That's the lesson from that observation. Um, the, we expect this baseline evaluation, which is currently being uh, taking place to cover about 20,000 federal employees. So that will be one of the first large scale evaluation benchmarking exercises within the public service. So a lot of the data we've been looking at is from third parties, from external kind of services, from the public service employee survey, which you know isn't really designed to get into the nitty gritty of hybrid. Um, so it's really going to add value or add insights into our research. Et puis les choses qu'on va pouvoir um, apporter de, de, de l'analyse, c'est par rapport à l'efficacité des employés, par rapport à leur mieux-être, par rapport à leur expérience dans le retour du travail, um, les différentes uh, uh, experience in the community, uh, 
soit dans les régions, dans la capitale nationale, dans les communautés euh, d'équité euh, en matière d'emploi, etc. Donc, c'est vraiment quelque chose auquel on, on, on est ravis. De, de, on, est, on anticipe les, les résultats euh, très bientôt. In terms of practices that um, uh, are things that, you know, are, are promising, part of this hybrid in a box project included a team charter exercise uh, as optional. It was taken, it was uh, stolen from other departments who were doing this, but it was uh, a practice that we, we decided to kind of help promulgate across the organization. Really, it's a charter activity where the employees can come together, discuss, you know, their preferences, their how they want to work together. And it's really, you know, it gives some clarity around some of these things, but also an opportunity to discuss things. You know, in addition to the task, it talks about how the team is going to function, how the operations are going to function, set out expectations. And the last thing I just want to leave some tips. And these are things that, you know, these are more personal tips too, and things that I've kind of over the last four years, I've been brought into this file. And these are kind of my big takeaways. Um, and I'm a manager also, so I'm kind of sharing these as a, uh, you know, uh, I'm a, a participant in the, the training myself. But, you know, one thing is recognize we're at the start and not at the end. Donc, c'est vraiment important de, de prendre cette perspective-là. Deuxièmement, il ne faut, il faut pas s'attendre d'avoir toutes les réponses aujourd'hui. Il y a beaucoup de choses qu'on ne sait pas. Alors, il faut être curieux, il faut être ouvert à, à obtenir des, des résultats qu'on ne s'attendait pas, d'avoir des perspectives auxquelles on... Les gens ont pas partagé. I would say also, don't try to fix everything at once. Do things on purpose and observe what happens and then focus on that. If you do something wrong, don't treat it as a fail, but create an opportunity to make a correction or to iterate to something better. And the last thing I'll leave you with, and I think it echoes in the rest of your agenda for the conference is, you know, pay attention to your needs as well as everyone else's needs. Alors, merci pour la question. Je pense que j'ai fait un peu le tour. Ça vous donne une saveur de ce, sur, lequel on, sur les choses sur lesquelles on travaille. Et puis, euh, j'anticipe beaucoup les questions qui sont à venir. Merci. Oui, merci beaucoup, Jason. Je pense que vous avez fait un, un excellent survol qui nous donne un, un aperçu sur les leçons apprises à date. Et un des messages clés que je vous entends dire à ce niveau-là, euh, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de, de variété dans les approches et qu'il faut garder esprit ouvert, étant donné que comment les gens vont vivre ça ou quelle sera la meilleure solution peut beaucoup varier entre les niveaux ou entre l'emplacement des employés ou d'autres variables possibles. J'apprécie également que vous nous faites part de, de l'évaluation qui est en cours. Je crois que ce sera une source absolument riche d'informations pour, pour l'ensemble de la fonction publique et euh, probablement une, une excellente pratique, euh, même au niveau international. Donc, euh, bravo et j'ai très hâte d'en entendre plus sur les résultats de ce travail. Alors, je vais me tourner vers Caroline maintenant. I'm going to turn to Caroline. To get a bit more specific about the kinds of support and tools that managers have been looking for in order to better prepare their teams for working in this hybrid environment. And, and that can include how to inspire their teams, how to maintain team spirit, how to create cohesion, and so forth. So, Caroline, can you share with us your experience on this, as well as any tools that, that have been developed and used at GAC to support your managers? Oui, absolument, Courtney. Merci beaucoup. Euh, merci de, de, de m'avoir invité. Mais je voudrais aussi merci aux participants de prendre le temps de vous joindre à ces discussions parce que c'est tellement important dans le moment dans lequel on vit. Je pense que c'est assez juste de dire qu'on vit euh, dans des moments assez extraordinaires et puis il y a des, des transformations sociales qui se passent vraiment. On, on les ressent au sein de nos, de nos organisations. Et euh, ça veut dire qu'on a vraiment besoin de cette réflexion-là sur le genre de gestionnaire qu'on est et le, les outils, les compétences qu'on qu va avoir besoin pour faire face, qu'on a besoin pour faire face à 
à ce qui s'en vient, à ce qui est déjà là. Uh, it's, it's a hugely challenging moment that we are living through as managers. And for, for uh, there are many layers to that, right? And I think as Jason said earlier, um, we don't know what the end state is just yet. Right, and so it's 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 um, it's uh, doubly complex, but it's also a very invigorating moment because I think as a public servant, there will be very few moments in our career where we can have such an impact on our organization. Right, um, it, you know, we feel uh, that we live or operate in such big machines, and now is actually. Uh, a, a part and I don't know that a moment like that will come again and so I think it's an opportunity for us uh, to seize uh, that moment so before I go to specifics I do want to quickly frame that a little bit in, in what global affairs has been doing in terms of transitioning to hybrid model I do have to give a big shout out to Yutra and her team because they were the trailblazers on all of the work they'd started early. And, um, and uh, so we really, they were an inspiration for how we approached it here. Um, Global Affair, we did, um, uh, you know, came to the same conclusion uh, as uh, our colleagues at Treasury Board that, that, you know, there is no one size fits all. We have such a variety of mandate and types of work that we do. And uh, and so we are we developed a layered approach, which is looking at uh, job functions and organizational requirements, but also individual circumstances. And so we developed, uh, you know, we gave managers a questionnaires and it was a yes and no questions. And, and that was our first attempt. Like we didn't ask manager to tell us how many days a week they think the position should come in. We'd ask them to answer a question about the position and then we develop a methodology, taking a bit the burden away from the managers to having to make those decisions and, and you know, having the same lens also across the organization. And then we prepared a manager's guide to, uh, to um, and ask that each that managers have conversation with each of their employees around three pillars. The first one is around career development to get a better understanding of how that's impacted uh, by, you know, by your presence in the office, outside the office where you're residing, and also how, if you're not in the national capital region, how we're going to make sure as a manager that you have opportunities also for career growth, right? And mentoring, knowledge transfer, all of these things that are part of your career development through the cycle of your career, right? Not just the onboarding and, and how you go uh, up the chain, but, you know, how do you uh, deboard your, your career? Uh, looking at individual circumstances, so uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, we did GBA uh, plus lens over our model, the work environment. Uh, if you're not in the office, what does your work environment look like? Right. And um, the third pillar was the team cohesion, because, yes, we're individual, but, you know, we are part of an organization. We're part of a team. And so our, the decisions around where I work could impact uh, in some cases, it doesn't in some cases, it could impact other team members, whether it's workload, whether it's the ability for planning, brainstorming, all of these things that we do when we're together. We developed a guide with uh, all again, you know, with our equity seeking groups with um, with uh, employees as well. And that we did also uh, talk to our, our union reps uh, to get their uh, views on, on how, where that, uh, those things that we were putting forward. So right now uh, at Global Affairs, where um, most employees have a sense of how many days they're expected to be in the office, or they have, you know, for those who have full-time telework, they're still on that model. Um, but I think uh, I think it was uh, you, Courtney, who said earlier, or maybe you try. Really, like it falls on the managers, right? They're the front line in terms of developing this, and it's really about. And that's why become getting to know your team very well is uh, a, such an important. It, it was always important, but we did it organically before, I think much more organically. And now we have to be more intentional about it. And I think, you know, in the case of global affairs, our deputy ministers have said very clearly through town halls, through broadcast messages, that the future is hybrid, but people don't believe it. 
right? We have 65% of our employees in a recent survey we did said they're, they're not sure that the flexibility will continue to apply. They're worried about that. So people are not hearing it. People are saying it black on white. We hear it from the clerk, but it's still very much of a, ah, uh, you know, is this? So I think as managers, we have to be mindful of that, that kind of level of uncertainties that our uh, employees are, are feeling, right? And we need to, to bring um, that with us. I think we don't know what the end state is going to be. And we said that before, but what we do know is it's not going to be like before. And so there's a loss somewhere, right? We're not returning to what it was before. For some people, yes, it will not change a whole lot. I mean, some of our colleagues at, at CSIS, we know are continuing to go into the office. Some of our colleagues here at Global Affairs as well, you know, some of the presence is still pretty unchanged, but for the majority, there's there's been a change. There's much more flexibility. But with that, some people are going to thrive in that and some people are gonna be grieving. Some people, uh, you know, this was very much part of their identity. And I think as a manager, it's important to understand your teams, understand where they're at uh, on this. What are they losing? What are they gaining? Where where do they, they, they feel, um, how they feel about this? And because it's the only way really to, um, to build that, that trust and to understand and as a manager, you also have to, uh, we will have to be, I mean, it was these, I think, you know, they, like Utra and you said also, they were always sound leadership practice, right? To be self-reflective and to kind of take a look at how you're, you're managing your team, but they'll be even more important now if you want to have uh, a team that really is able to, you know, to show up uh, and be their best. So I think, you know, a few very quick uh, uh, points, you know, understanding your team. I think the team's charter, which a lot of departments are doing, I think, yes, it is an investment, but it's a very important investment. And, and here, what we are doing is we're, we have a, a team of facilitators that, are, that uh, divisions can access. Uh, so if they want someone to help them do go through that exercise, you know, so it's to facilitate again that. Um, and it's important to remember, I think, as a manager to make space for all the views on your team, because not everyone uh, will feel the same way. I think it's, in, it's important to encourage employees to not just think about productivity as a to-do list, right? Your productivity is not just how you accomplish. I mean, productivity is one of, of six key leadership competencies, right? But you need to, there's knowledge transfer, there's mentoring, there's coaching, there are things, you know, when a colleague comes and interrupts you, it's your opportunity to, to transfer your knowledge, right? So it's, it's so we're trying to encourage our, our everyone to think outside of that and think about diversity. Not everybody's experience pre-pandemic was positive. You mentioned Courtney microaggressions and uh, something that's happening tomorrow on microaggression. I think many uh, employees uh, are, are less keen to come back because they feel less microaggression. Employee with physical disabilities are, you know, so how do we create? And this, again, it goes back to the fantastic opportunity we have ahead of us to create the public service that we want that, you know, that is inclusive of, of everybody. Um, be intentional, and this was mentioned before, is also as a message that we drum uh, up here. Uh, C'est important de, de, parce que comme on se, on, comme on se voit plus de façon organique, on se connaît plus de façon euh, organique, de façon naturelle, on doit prendre le temps de, de bien connaître les gens autour de nous et communiquer. C'est tellement important de communiquer, même si on dit on n'a pas toutes les réponses, mais c'est important de partager l'information qu'on a. Euh, c'est très, euh, c'est vraiment à la base de la relation de confiance qu'on doit établir avec nos employés euh, et avec euh, nos collègues autour de l'organisation. Alors, je pense que je m'arrêterai ici. Euh, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Caroline. Euh, quelques éléments qui, qui sont vraiment ressortis pour moi de, de vos propos. Euh, C'est la dimension humaine que, que tous les panélistes ont mentionné. Vous avez tous mentionné la dimension humaine. Euh, mais Caroline, vous êtes allée encore un peu plus loin pour nous rappeler qu'en tant qu'humain, on a un côté... Euh, 
émotionnel de comment on va vivre ce changement transformationnel-là. Um, you've mentioned some people will be thriving, but some people may also be grieving how things were before. And it's important as managers for us to create space um, for people to be able to express how this is happening for them. So I really appreciated you tying it back to Utra's point around intentional leadership and, and to really bringing in that uh, aspect of creating, creating space uh, for all. Um, for all people, but also for all perspectives on how this is this is going. Finally, I, I find your messages around these extraordinary times to be quite inspiring. Je, je m'inspire beaucoup de vos messages par rapport au fait qu'il se peut qu'on n'ait pas à vivre une autre occasion aussi importante euh, pour alimenter le changement euh, organisationnel. À grande échelle. Donc, very inspiring to think about the role that we can play in supporting this type of, of transformation. It, it may be a once in a career opportunity for, for some of us, um, and also to create the public service that we want. So, thank you for reminding us of those important opportunities that are present at this point in time. J'aimerais vous rappeler à, à tous et tous ceux qui participent dans l'événement que vous pouvez nous fournir vos questions. Um, you can provide us with your questions in the language of your choice by using the bubble icon at the top right corner of the purple banner of the broadcasting platform. As I mentioned before, you won't see your questions appear in the chat, but our moderator will be receiving them and then passing them on to us so that we can discuss them with the panel. Donc, n'hésitez pas à nous fournir vos questions. So, speaking about the diversity um, across the system in terms of models that are being utilized, Jason, I'm, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about what you're seeing in terms of the specific types of, of models and, and, and how that's working. And Utra and Caroline, if, if you have anything to add after Jason, I'll, I'll reserve some time for that as well if you want to comment. Jason? Sure, great. Thanks. Thank you for the question. So I, I guess in the um, the models that we're looking at here, they work they kind of um, they vary along two major dimensions. One is on the dimension of flexibility and the other is on the dimension of frequency. So, for example, on the dimension of flexibility, that has to do with, you know, how much uh, autonomy or who makes the decision about who and when people come to work. So, in some models, the, the you know, it's imposed by management or it's agreed to by a collective group of um, the team level, for example, or another option is, you know, individuals have the autonomy to make that decision. So, that's one dimension. The other dimension is frequency, which has to do with you know, on a scale of one to five days, how often does one uh, or a team come into the office and then everything in between? So, you know, there are jobs where five days on the office is the norm because the job requires people to be on the site. And then there's others where there's more flexibility. Um, and then there's, in there, there's uh, approaches where when you combine frequency and, and uh, flexibility, there are combination of say, uh, you know, I'll just use my example. We have a an agreement in our team to be present two days a week. So part of it is we have an anchor day. We, we, we've agreed together that, you know, Thursday is the day where we're all trying to kind of be together. And then the other day is kind of a swing day, if you wish. Um, and then I know of other teams uh, who are picking two anchor days. So again, that's what's meant by different models. So they vary um, along those scales. We've tried to kind of put them in categories in our evaluation so that we can compare them and then we can isolate the variables and see what the impact of different things are to see um, how those play out. But um, again, departments are not limited to the ones that we're thinking. So they, they can, um, you know, tailor these or they can, uh, you know, invent other dimensions that are more important to them um, to deliver their operations, really. So j'espère que ça répond à la question. C'est un peu les, les dimensions qu'on a prévues dans notre recherche. Oui, oui c'est super utile, Jason, d'entendre ces deux dimensions-là, de la flexibilité et de la fréquence, 
comme élément qui, qui définissent un peu la variété possible d'approches dans le système. Outara, Caroline, est-ce que vous auriez quelque chose à ajouter? Oui, je pense que euh, je peux ajouter juste euh, notre modèle. Uh, you know, Carolyn kind of alluded to, thank you for the shout out, Carolyn. Uh, ESDC, uh, you know, we did uh, get a, take a bit of a head start on this and wanted a completely um, objective, uh, data-driven, evidence-based model. Um, and uh, we, as you know, We started also with a job function analysis. ESDC is a huge organization. We're nearly, I don't know, 42,000 people or getting somewhere there with uh, very, very diverse functions, uh, service delivery, policy, enabling. So there is, you know, to Jason's point, even within our organization, there can't be one size fits all. Uh, but We wanted a framework that was objective and consistent across the enterprise. And it is grounded in, as we said, we, we serve Canadians, so it has to be business driven, but employee informed. And so the job function analysis, the job function analysis primarily determined which types of jobs can be done, must be done fully on site. And that I would say, you know, a lot of our in-person service delivery and other functions, uh, predominantly off-site, and I say predominantly off-site, which is not full-time telework because there is a, a, a an on-site component of that, which is not as frequent as hybrid. And then there is the hybrid, which is a, the true combination of the off-site and on-site. And then, as Carolyn also said, you know, uh, teams took this back, and discussed among themselves to determine their own models and rhythms, both with the, the, the flexibility, and yes, we are leaving it up to the business units to determine what works best, both in terms of, uh, especially in, in frequency, although you know, our deputy minister has also been clear uh, that you know, hybrid means several days a month. Uh, uh, you know, because people are uh, interpreting this different ways and we have provided uh, additional support to our managers to help them understand what kind of activities can be done, are best done on site for, for hybrid workers and what type of activities are also important even for the predominantly off-site workers that could be done on site and should be done on site uh, periodically for culture purposes, you know, onboarding, training, social connections. Even if your work can be done independently, there are enormous benefits for individuals and an organization to come on site periodically to, to make those connections. So, and, and yes, you know, so teams will discuss and we are, uh, two months into implementation of, of work arrangements and teams finding, finding their rhythms uh, within our overall, uh, overall framework. So that's, that's all I would add. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Utra, for that. Um, I think I, what I'm picking up from what you're saying and tying back to Jason is, is this idea of, of intentionality again. So Jason was using the term of the anchor day, you know, when you decide to bring your team together physically on site, having that clear intentionality around what it is that you will accomplish together and what are the types of activities that are best suited where you'll have the best results if people are coming together. So again, that intention really comes out strongly for me and what you're, you're bringing forward. Caroline, did you want to add to this? Yeah, just a, a very briefly, I think, you know, right now, I know a lot of the conversations are focused on number of days in the office, right? And this is really what's driving the conversation. And it's normal. It's our starting point. But I think in a lot of the, the, the sessions we have with managers across uh, our department, we're trying to make them think, 
think, try to think two, three years from now, what is this going to look like, right? And, and that state where it's really a change in our relationship with the office that is, that is going to change, I guess, right? Um, and, and again, I think it goes back to what Utara says, like what drives you to be in the office? What, what, um, what activities are best done uh, in the office together? You know, the, the mentoring also going back to the, the transfer of knowledge. And so I think, you know, as we're, as we're getting our feet what I guess, or as we're getting more and more comfortable living in the gray areas over the next, you know, few months, I think we'll move away. Hopefully, we'll move away from that very, uh, you know, number of days in the office. And because there's not all the weeks are the same, right? So yes, maybe two days a week sounds great, but maybe it's not the same every week, and maybe it's not all of my Tuesdays and Thursdays that are all the same, and so what do I come here if I'm just going to be on Teams all day? And these are the things that we hear all the time, right? Well, Tuesday is my day, but I have Teams meetings all day, so I'm here in a cubicle and, and not feeling particularly, I'm not getting any of the benefits you're telling me I'm going to get when I come, right? And then, um, and I, so I think, you know, thinking about that flexibility, thinking in terms of monthly, whether times of the day you know sometimes I, I tell uh people maybe you want to consider you know maybe your mornings could be spent at home and your afternoon in the office or vice versa right but I think you know it is important and, and what's really hard to define is when we say where we we do find some skepticism is when we talk about the culture right we want to maintain our organizational culture and then people say well what culture are you talking about? Because there are many, many cultures. And so, you know, each area have different culture. And so how is there? So I think it's hard to define. There is a, a, an energy that you get from talking to your colleagues in person, from brainstorming in person, from doing forward planning in person. And I think that we will be um, we will be better served when we are able to move the conversation from the sort of the activity, the kind of activity that you want to do in the office. Um, at the same time, I know that um, we are looking at the, the hybrid model as a way to, um, and, and the opportunity of teleworking as a way to diversify our workforce, right? And to, to get uh, to spread the economic benefits of federal employment maybe to different parts of Canada to get talent that perhaps would not move to the national capital region but and I'm thinking particularly of our colleagues who come from indigenous communities and the ability for them to uh, to to stay anchored in their community whether it's on a full-time basis of so I think those are elements that we have discovered they're they're doable and possible and so we want to preserve them uh, but then you know people that are teleworking will not be in the office at all, right? And so what is the fairness and how, and it goes back to, again, I think being uh, intentional. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Caroline. I really appreciate your point about taking a bit of a longer view, that two, three year horizon, and allowing ourselves the time to get into a rhythm so that we can start to see how this can, can work. And I, I wanna get back to your point about culture, because that is incredibly important. But just to segue on, on where you just left off in terms of um, recruitment and, and including a, a broader diversity of Canadians um, from different parts of the country into the public service. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about how GAC is looking at that and, and how you ensure that there's a feeling of belonging in those teams when they may consist of people in a whole bunch of different places. And GAC would have had <laughs> tremendous experience with this over the years, not just uh, because of the pandemic, but by the nature of your work. So how do we help people feel like they belong even if not everyone is located in Ottawa? You want me to go first, Amy? Courtney? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, you're absolutely right. But, you know, we learned so much from the pandemic because there used to be uh, our geo groups, which are, you know, sort of the home division, let's say, for 
uh, that's responsible for a bilateral relationship with a country and our mission in that country would you know would not necessarily plan things together they would uh, exchange emails and everything but now with the pandemic it's like the, those walls have gone down and and we have discovered that we are we are able to develop you know, programming together to plan things, to do forward planning, brainstorming together, and to be on the same page. And so we are definitely keeping that one with us going forward. Um, but I think, you know, someone, uh, I think someone was asking uh, about, you know, colleagues that there are some colleagues in person in one in, in Ottawa, and then a few colleagues dispersed around Canada. And how do you, is it okay to still do get togethers? right with the colleagues that are in the same place because you're leaving out people that are not there and i think i think it should be okay to still have those relationships that's that's uh, my view i'm happy to hear from you trying and jason's view on that but you also have to do um, to do additional sort of elements to bring the teams together, right? I think the IT is uh, is going to be very helpful as well to facilitate. Not everything. So some managers are saying we all are not going to do high. Or if it, if not one person is if one person is not here, then we're all going to be on our computers, right? And I don't know. I think you know you'll have to figure out what works for your team, what works for the team members, you know. Um, but I think it's important to, again, uh, to, to, to find those, those moments and, and make deliberate, be deliberate about incorporating, including, and, uh, and keeping all the good things we learned of the past two years. Thanks for that. I think what I'm hearing is it's not an either or, it's an and, and it's figuring out how that's going to work in your specific context because those human relationships are, are so incredibly important. Uh, I'll turn to Jason and then to Utra if you wanted to add to this issue of when you have folks physically located in Ottawa and other folks located elsewhere and, and how you bring people together. Go ahead, Jason. So I think one of the things that um, is different going forward is, uh, and I think it applies to how we plan things, I think an important mindset shift has to be towards uh, dynamic planning so that when we're planning for things, it's not so much about uh, making things permanent, but making things focused in the moment uh, to do the job that needs to be done. So whether that has to do with, uh, you know, recruitment. So if I look back maybe three years ago, you know, the model or the default setting for recruitment was I'm hiring someone forever. Whereas now I think what we want to try and implement in our planning is you know, I'm, I'm hiring a capability and the person has pathways to come and go into the organization as opposed to, a, you know, a set thing that they're going to do forever. So it's really implementing a dynamic mindset about the work itself, how the people interact with the work, uh, work and how they might kind of, you know, accept the path that we give them, but also create their own path. Um, a lot of the jobs um, are changing so quickly that, you know, employees have a lot of autonomy to, you know, write their own ticket to a to a large degree in terms of getting involved in projects and kind of putting their hand up to participate in things. And some of these, these, um, you know, previously, if if you weren't in the NCR, you might not have been able, you might not have been top of mind or even considered for some of this. Whereas now, I think, uh, Caroline, you mentioned that you know it's th those things are now uh, possible, right? So the, just the looking at the world as uh, opportunities as opposed to deficiencies is really a mindset that uh, you know that I think if we leverage that and and multiply it can really change a lot of those things slowly but surely. Thanks for that Jason. Utra did you have something you wanted to add on this? So yes I agree with my my colleagues but i'm also going to respectfully disagree because that's what makes debate and discussion fun i agree with the point of the the notion of intentionality and what i would use the term is collaboration equity uh the equity between people who are in the office not in the office in ottawa not in ottawa yes we should be intentional uh, as far as possible, 
as uh, to try and make sure people feel included. Now I give you an example of my small team. Half of us are in the NCR, half all over. So we also have a hybrid model. Uh, our anchor day is Tuesday, where we have the NCR folks come in, but we have our hybrid meeting with our whole team, our everybody. I also had an in-person planning retreat in September. I brought in everybody. And it was phenomenal because the whole dynamic, efficiency, riffing off of each other, that whole brainstorming dynamic is, is cannot be replicated virtually. And virtually we would have been exhausted, you know. Uh, it was beautiful, you know, did some social events. So yes, do this as much as possible, but where I am going to disagree is on the notion of equity. Equity means doesn't mean equality. Equity does not mean everybody gets the same experience all the time. Living outside, living far away from somewhere, and here I'm going to cite, for example, the policy function, because that's where I come from. Parliament is in, is in Ottawa. A lot of policy gets made in Ottawa because this is where ministers are. Uh, this is where national stakeholders are. I've grown up being in a room, grown up, I mean, in the policy function, being in a room with ministers, ministers, staff, stakeholders, and a lot of learning happens in a room or on the margins of a meeting. So I agree that we should incorporate regional perspectives from all over Canada in our policy work and all of our work and give opportunities. At the same time, I think we should be super clear that the person out in Vancouver may not get the same learning and development opportunities as the person in the NCR. And that's okay because they've made a choice choices have been made. I have somebody on my team that says I made a choice to move away and I get it that I may not have the same experience as others. Maybe I'll move back to the NCR one day to, you know. So I think it's also we have to be very careful because back to the point of everybody's experience has to be like 100% equal. Well, no, it's not going to be because jobs are different functions are different and some people have made choices. So as long as we can get the maximum inclusion possible within the parameters, I think we're good. So that's where I'm going to be maybe a bit controversial and go a little bit color outside the, the lines. Thanks. It's important to do that, Uthra. And it's important to acknowledge that there are a wide diversity of, of jobs across the federal public service. And to your point, some of them are indeed best done in Ottawa, and some of them can be done anywhere in the country. Um, and so it, it is really important, as um, I think it was Caroline, you were talking about the conversations that managers have to have around career development with employees and, and being really clear about options and decisions and, and you know, what will be some of the likely implications of, um, of some of those choices. Excellent. I want to dive in to this question of culture. Caroline spoke to it briefly. One of the questions that came through from participants is, and we can speak to culture a little bit more broadly as well, but I'll start with this more specific question around the danger that a hybrid environment creates of, a, of an us versus them culture. So the us being the folks who are physically in the office, interacting together, um, versus those who are outside of the office, who are not privy to those daily interactions. And it comes back to, to Uthra's point about uh, collaboration equity as being a factor at play here. So wanting to hear you speak about this, this cultural uh, issue of the us versus them, but also if you wanted to expand a little bit more broadly about what hybrid means for our organizational cultures more generally. So um, Uthra, I see you nodding a bit here. Do you want us to kick us off with this? So sure. It's so interesting because this one talks to the notion of proximity bias. That's what I'm understanding here, mm. is that the folks that aren't in the office are somehow 
feeling that there's meetings or decisions or stuff going on and they're not part of it. Uh, and especially if the managers in the office, they're getting excluded. I think that's the, the understanding. So it goes back to uh, leadership norm, uh, intentional leadership, uh, and uh, one more, but proximity bias. If you are a manager and you have employees who uh, work, uh, you know, hybrid, who are in the office or not in the office and work remotely, it is up to you to absolutely ensure that collaboration equity. I would say, for example, if you have a hybrid meeting and after the, the meeting's over and the camera goes off and you're in the room and you have a sidebar discussion that was very germane or material to the discussion, then that needs to get recorded and shared out with the people who are off site and weren't party to that. Like we do that in some of our records of decision. First of all, we like to maintain good meeting, hybrid meeting etiquette. And just um, I'm um, putting that out there that we uh, developed at ESDC uh, a guide uh, on, on how to organize effective meetings in a flexible work environment. So whether it's a fully on site hybrid or fully virtual, there's a way I mean, this is can't we can't do this organically. We have to be intentional about how we do meetings. So we have a guide. So, and one of the things is do not have where possible all these sidebar discussions if you're not sharing that information with the people who are offside. So that's collaboration equity. But you know, I'm very intrigued. And the other thing is proximity bias for managers. If you're in the office and you see people all around. Don't just go and give a task or an opportunity to the person you see in the office. Be very intentional about not about who you're giving tasks to, who are you giving opportunities. Be enormously transparent with all of your, your team, no matter where they are. That's hugely important in, in, in building and maintaining trust. The other side of this, I don't actually like the binary that's being set up, the us versus them, but it is very provocative, so I'll, I'll bite. What I've also been hearing in other fora is the fact, the, the notion that, you know, there are some many public sector jobs that must be done on site. There's just no, no opportunity for remote work. And it's the remote workers who are the center of attention. And there's way too much talk about them. And they are more privileged because now they have the flexibility versus the on site workers who don't have that flexibility. And, and then what about that? Uh, so I think that's, that's an important thing. And uh, we also must in, ensure that the, the, we don't want to set up two cultures within an organization where one, one, one group of workers feel more privileged than the others in terms of their working conditions. I think we also need to be enormously um, uh, sensitive to that. But again, I will go back to my point about equity doesn't mean thing, mean everything is equal. Working conditions should be good for everybody, regardless of their location of work. Thanks. Thanks, Sutra. Over to you, Jason. Thank you. So uh, I think another dimension of this, um, so the question that we see here is kind of it ends with how do we avoid this? And I think, you know, part of the the answer to that is to um, not so much how do we avoid it, but like how do we how do we track what the actual impact of all this is? So a, qu a question might be, does does it actually make a difference? And if so, what is what does the difference look like? And what is it? Does it in fact? So if people, if people have different uh, experiences, does it in fact create uh, things that can't be overcome or create things that don't have a, a mechanism to to deal with it or to like you know Utra mentioned like the the way that you take notes and your etiquette kind of mitigates some of that so it it may it may may just be simple mitigation and then the other thing that you said in your comments earlier has to do with um, and I think that the choices people are making right in terms of um, I think there's a different um, I think there's added variables now in terms of what what people what is driving uh, each individual's personal decisions about 
um, how much they work, what they want to do outside of work, and that, how that interaction happens. And some of this has a, I don't know if it's a cultural uh, dimension, but it may have changed the a level of importance of work or other things in their life vis-a-vis -vis what they're doing on a daily basis. So I think that's another dimension of the us versus them. So, I, you know, I, I'll bite as well. I think that's an issue to kind of better understand, but I think it's also, it's um, sometimes these have to do with, um, I think things people choose to do. And then other times it's kind of like other people are choosing things that impact you, you know, and then what's the dynamic between those. And um, I think the important thing though is to track like the data on it so that in the absence of data, you know, we fill in our own uh, data strategy with our perceptions of what's going on and attributing motivation to uh, the people around us and kind of experiencing things in a, you know, a certain way. So I think, you know, there's a danger there too and not kind of addressing it head on or talking about it up front. That's kind of how I think about that. Yes, and, and to your point, Jason, I think if you add uncertainty into the mix uh, and you don't have data, uh, it can become even more even more challenging. Uh, Caroline, anything to add on the on the culture conversation? Well, I feel like most of it was said, but I'll just add a, a, a little a little. Uh, this conversation, this uh, the issue of proximity bias does come up a lot uh, in the context of the conversations we have here, and it's it's mainly related, not so much. Um, I mean, it does. It is partly on workload balance and and you know how uh, work gets assigned, but a lot of it is on career development, right? Oh, if I'm not here, I'm not going to get as many opportunities. I won't be included in the briefing and all of that. And I think to that uh, there are perhaps some mitigating. Uh, um, tips and tricks and things that you know we can remind managers to be mindful of and and think you know can you invite a a the contributor or the drafter of this to the briefing and things like that particularly as many of these briefings are are very reg are regularly online um but also you know going back to the point that was made earlier about choices there is and I want to catch what I'm going to say carefully because I, but you know, there is a, a, an employee responsibility as well, right? In terms of, um, there is in terms of making sure you ask questions if you don't understand uh, something because of the, you know, because you're away somewhere else and you may do, you may feel you're not benefiting from the full conversation, right? To go back, to ask probing questions, to seek clarification. These are all in, in things we need we're supposed to do anyway, right? Uh, in terms of raising your hand and saying, you know, I actually would like a little bit more inclusion on, on this or on that, or saying, you know, by the way, when you go and brief such person, could I be included? So there's part of it. And I think the role of the manager in that is making sure to remind their team to do this, but to make that space for that as well, right? So there is, it can't all be on the managers, right? <laughs> but but it is a shared, it's a shared responsibility, I think, in, in proximity, uh, in proximity bias. So, and, you know, and the other thing I would say is we've been talking a lot about empathy and absolutely, I think it's key now uh, in, in these times, but it's, again, it's not a thing that should apply, it should only be with the managers, right? Employees also need to have empathy and um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's been missing <laughs> uh, because people, uh, people have gone through very difficult situation in the past two years. Right. And so anyway, I, I don't need to go further into that, but, uh, it's a shared responsibility, I think. Absolutely. Merci, Caroline. I'm seeing from the questions um, a few that relate to managers having to motivate their teams to, to come into the office for a set number of days. And part of that conversation is involving having to define what their organization means by hybrid, and, and certainly that can vary from organization to organization, um, but it's also involving having to motivate their staff, particularly for those who um, may be less in operational type roles that would naturally require in-person. So those who are uh, working in areas that are, are more knowledge-based, 
Um, and so managers are having to motivate their staff to come in and are, are, are possibly facing a certain amount of, of resistance. Wondering what your advice is for those managers who are facing resistance beyond what we just talked about around uh, empathy and, and having open conversations, clarifying expectations and so forth. What else can managers do to face this challenge? I'll maybe start with Jason and then I'll go Utra and Caroline. Merci, je me compte chanceux d'être premier à ce, cette question-là. Um, je pense aussi que cette situation-là peut aussi, on peut prendre le, le, le binaire qu'on a mentionné, le us versus them. Alors, des fois, les, le gestionnaire peut se sentir un peu dans cette situation-là aussi. C'est peut-être une autre application. Um, je pense ici, um, ici, je donne un peu mon opinion personnelle dans le sens que quand, quand on passe beaucoup de temps avec nos employés, à, à les convaincre sur un, quand, de, du pourquoi venir travailler, je pense qu'on n'a pas nécessairement euh, la bonne conversation. Je, je pense que c'est une conversation qu'on ne peut pas gagner et puis c'est difficile de convaincre quelqu'un de quelque, quelque chose euh, où la personne a une, une perception assez bien, tu sais, qui est développé depuis deux ans. Alors, ce que moi, moi j'essaie de, de faire dans ces situations-là, c'est de partager avec l'employé ce que moi, je ressens au niveau d'expliquer de, euh, quand on parle de, de sujets comme la productivité. On a parlé un peu, tu sais, comme au niveau individuel, c'est très, tu sais, on peut avoir une perception de notre capacité d'accomplir les tâches. De, de finir nos travaux, de mettre, de, de, de mettre les points sur les i et de faire notre travail individuel, mais ce que, où je trouve qu'il y a un, comme un manque de, de, de connaissance, c'est vraiment comme le, la, le prochain niveau. C'est quoi l'effet de si tout le monde travaillait sur leurs tâches euh, pendant les prochaines trois ou cinq ans? Ça va être quoi l'empathie envers nos collègues? Ça va être quoi la, la nature ou la... La, la façon qu'on va collaborer, si on, si on ne pratique pas ces choses-là de façon quotidienne. Euh, si j'ai des enfants aussi, je regarde leur expérience dans l'école, ça va être quoi l'impact sur l'apprentissage informel sur les employés vis-à-vis -vis leur chance d'observer les autres, euh, d'interagir avec eux. Alors, c'est un peu comme ça que je regarde la question. Uh, I guess what I, I try not to, con, to engage in a, an activity of convincing people Um, that I'm right and they, they need to come in the office. It's more exchanging my perspective as a manager that, you know, I, I'm interested and I'm accountable for and making sure everyone is individually productive, but I also have responsibilities that are beyond uh, individuals and I need to make sure that uh, the team is cohesive. And then another layer above that, that the branch is cohesive and that we're interacting with one another and that our, the, the information is flowing, not just in our team, but beyond our team and to our clients and to our stakeholders. And, you know, I, I openly wonder, you know, what the data will tell us in two years about the, our capacity to network, our capacity to, you know, leverage um, friendships in the system, leverage people who are willing to help each other. I, I don't have the data for this, but I'm convinced that people who you know and that are, you know, you've helped before are, if you ask them for help, they're more likely to say yes than if you have only emailed them. Like I said, I don't have data for this. That would be my hypothesis. Um, but, you know, I think that's another area of data that we have to kind of live through, measure and observe, and then, you know, take stock of that. It may not matter. I, I just don't know the answer yet. So I share that openly. <laughs> mm hmm Thanks so much for that, Jason. And I, I think what you're saying about having open conversations about what we could be missing out on two, three years down the road in terms of cohesion, in terms of relationship, in terms of stakeholder relations, and so on and so forth, and being, being open about those conversations, I think is really, really important. Uh, before I go over to, um, to you, Utra, there's another question that came in that sort of ties into this. So, so managers having perhaps to, to try to convince some of their employees to come in, but other managers facing the added challenge of, of being in a physical location where, where local health authorities are suggesting additional COVID precautions are warranted. So having to balance um, 
the desire to, to start us down this hybrid path with uh, serious health concerns of, of employees. I'm wondering if you could add that dimension to, um, to your reflections on this. So thanks. So Jason, the question you're wondering about, Microsoft already did that study in 2020 with 61,000 workers who were working fully remotely. And what they, what they concluded and found out through that study was exactly what you surmised. The, the silos of your immediate, you know, immediate team became deeper and entrenched. The weak ties, the ties with other parts of the enterprise broke down. So those weak ties are enormously important, not just in integrating our work across an enterprise, but, but things like job opportunities, networking, gr growth opportunities. Those, those happen through weak ties, not your immediate team. And those broke down completely when everybody was working remotely. So that answer already exists in a very large study done by Microsoft. Um, but some people like my team has compiled a ton of research on, on you know, the benefits of, of, of in-person versus virtual, the risks, long-term risks. I feel for one, one cohort that I, I really am concerned about here is Gen Z and uh, the newer, um, newer hires, young public servants. Um, you know, Carolyn, to your point, there's not one culture, there's many cultures, but if I may say so and be so bold to say you can't learn culture from your bedroom. Like if you are a new public servant, how do you learn anything if you have never ever or will never have the, the chance to step in into a room with your other colleagues or step into an office or have the chance ever to, to, to meet in person? to observe. I mean, Gartner, Gartner has done a lot of research and Gen Z wants flexibility, but they also want the in-person experience to network, to have pizza, to, for they're worried about their career development, right? And that can't all, always happen uh, virtually. The onboarding and, and uh, for new, and, new hires, we are very, very uh, mindful of that. Um, on the other one, I would rather not wade into Health Canada's bailiwick. All I know is that we in the federal public service have some of the most stringent public health requirements on site compared to anything around us, whether they're provincial, municipal, the most stringent requirements. We are absolutely at ESDC, we're very mindful of that. I'm in the office, you know, we've got to wear masks uh if we're walking around and not seated at our workplace where you know we have all of that in place um so i think i think i mean can't speak for everybody else but there are people who are coming into the office because their job requires them to do that and uh we are enormously mindful uh, of those uh, of those uh, of, of, and of course, if the if the public health situation changes, of course, you know we are always going. Our stance will will be responsive to whatever the public health guidelines are. Um, so that's all I I will add to that. Thanks. I appreciate that, uh, Utra. I, I'm watching the clock and I'm I'm watching the questions come in and I'm wondering, Caroline, if you'd be comfortable following me into this other question, just shifting gears a little bit around how managers can, can combat the attrition of skilled employees. Now, certainly this isn't something that is only an issue within the federal public service. It's a, it's a global issue. There's a global race for talent. Uh, so wondering what your thoughts might be in terms of, of how we, we deal with the potential of attrition as employees might be looking to different departments who have adopted different types of models. I think it's it's a great question and it's uh, it's one that we have thought about long and hard because of obviously here at global affairs we are a department of relationship 
right? I mean, whether they're trade, we're trying to ad advance our commercial interests, trying to advance our bilateral interests, development assistance, consular, a lot of it is, you know, uh, dealing with global crisis, right? I was just talking to my colleague earlier today uh, who we were supposed to have lunch, but she couldn't because she has to go deal with a crisis uh, in the Americas. So, uh, so I think we are a bit of a different department. Uh, obviously, I know everyone, please don't roll your eyes. I know we say this a lot, <laughs> but um, and then when this started, uh, you know, and we heard some department, uh, e even, you know, e emails were received here in some areas to say, come and work for us. We do full time. And like, ah, no, we're going to lose all of our people. So we were very, very mindful of, for example, for our corporate services um, to have that extra flexibility, right? And to say, you know, you uh, do what you need to do again to deliver on your mandate, right? So if you need to uh, provide more flexibility to your team, to your employees, because, but at some point, and, uh, and I hope my colleague Jason is listening, um, I think it's important to have a little bit of, of I, I don't know, I'm, I'm scared to get treasury board guidance on this because you know we never want to have that we are we want to have all the flexibility but i think there are um there are for certain i think for certain categories of of work right certain type of work we know there's more there's more like I, i'm thinking about my colleagues again uh, mes collègues dans, dans les technologies de l'information c'est tellement difficile en ce moment de recruter des gens et on en a besoin parce que c'est ça qui va épauler Notre, notre habilité à pivoter vers un modèle hybride de façon de, 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 de la bonne façon, de façon productive. Alors, on a besoin de cette flexibilité-là. Et, euh, et alors, je pense qu'encore une fois, il y, a, il y a la question de la la question de, 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 de bien, mais ce que ça prend aussi, c'est que ça nous prend des meilleures, euh, une, plus de données, de meilleures données sur euh, nos ressources humaines, sur le personnel qui Pourrait. Parce qu'il n'y a pas juste la question, il n'y a pas juste la question de des gens qui vont chercher dans d'autres ministères pour avoir des meilleurs uh, shopping around, but there's also the people who are maybe closer to retirement who are saying, well, you know, at this point, I'm so close, I might as well I like just go and bring their great skills to the private sector, right, for the last five or seven or 10 years of their career, right? So I think that's really, um, that's really something that we need to, 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 to think about. And we need to have better, we need to have better access to, to data in order to um, uh, have some foresight on these things, right? And right now, I know this is something that for my organization, it's a question that we ask a lot. Like, how many people do we think are going to leave the organization in the next three to five years? And it's not necessarily those foreign service officers who are going to go brought on posting, right? It's those, again, those um, very skilled uh, workers that we need to keep. Sorry, I know, uh, Courtney, I didn't answer the question very specifically, but it's a tough one. It's a really tough one. And Jason is the one on the hook for that one. I'm joking. <laughs> Well, I was just about to pass the ball to, to Jason. <laughs> so thanks for that, Caroline. Busy, Jason. So I guess, uh, you know, I would respond to that by saying um, maybe another tip. Let's use the right lever for the right problem. So, for example, and then maybe another principle, which is um, focus on principles rather than rules. So it would probably be easy for someone like me to implement a directive to tell everyone what not to do, but it may not incentivize the right behavior in the system, or it may close off opportunities um, for people to rethink how they do recruitment. So for example, you mentioned the IT group. I'm aware of my colleagues in the chief information office who are rethinking how they're doing recruitment for IT and taking a different approach. And then sometimes these, these issues require horizontal collaboration as opposed to every department continuing to work in their in their small sphere of influence. So I think rules, uh, rules when needed, but not necessarily rules. Um, so I appreciate what you're saying, though. I do hear that, you know, it, it, you know, and that's one of the things that we want to be able to use evidence for is to really put, you know, have a data based approach to what is required at the enterprise level 
versus what would be convenient. Like we want to really, when we put rules across the system, we want to make sure that they're actually doing the thing that they're supposed to, and that they're not having unintended consequences and, and not incentivizing the culture that we want to have in place. So if the culture is collaboration and strategic recruitment, you know, sometimes we can do something uh, that incentivizes hoarding your culture, hoarding your talent, as opposed to sharing it and growing it. So that, that's how I would, I know you put me on the spot and I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not angry about it, but again, it's, it's a back and forth. And I, like, I guess what it's rooted in is that, you know, the on the ground phenomena where people are leaving. So what do we do about it? What's the right lever? And what do we do in the short term? So what could we do like right now? But then again, three years down the road, what is what is the solution on a on a scalable, you know, feasible basis that really gives results? Je ne sais pas si c'est une réponse, mais c'est plus un, une perspective additionnelle qu'il faut réfléchir, faut prendre en considération. Oui, je crois que c'est une très bonne réflexion, uh, Jason. Et on, on est presque à la fin de notre session ensemble. On pourrait facilement euh, continuer à, à, à parler des différents thèmes euh, qu'on a déjà soulevés ou des autres questions euh, qui nous sont venues. Ce que je dirais aux participants et aux participantes, euh, c'est de vous encourager de, de continuer d'avoir ces conversations-là tout autour euh, du symposium, mais aussi avec, euh, avec vos collègues euh, gestionnaires, euh, parce que nous sommes, comme Carole l'a dit, dans un moment extraordinaire et euh, nous sommes tous et toutes nous faisons tous et toutes partie euh, du changement qui est en cours. So just encouraging everyone to continue the conversation. Uh, we are all part of this, of this change and we all have a role to play. So in closing, I'd, I'd like to give an opportunity for our panelists to share any final quick words of wisdom uh, that they would like to share uh, with participants. Utra, over to you. Alors, merci Courtney, merci mes collègues, Jason, Caroline, ça fait un plaisir d'être de, de, ici, it's been a great conversation. Moi, je, comme j'ai mentionné au début, euh, soyez curieux, gardez un esprit ouvert, euh, soyez courageux, it's a very exciting time right now. And, um, you know, those four, four norms have a growth mindset, you know, don't um, be kind to yourself. You know, empathy is about uh, not just others to yourself. It's a learning experience. Um, as my colleagues have said, we don't know where it's going, but it's very exciting. We all have uh, the opportunity to make this successful. I guess what I'll do is I'll quote, quote Gandhi and say, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world, like embrace it and uh, make it, uh, make it, make it a success because only you can. C'est tout pour moi, merci. Merci beaucoup. Caroline? Oui, merci. Uh, merci beaucoup, Courtney, uh, Utara, Jason, and, and, uh, et puis à l'École de la fonction publique pour l'opportunité. C'est vraiment, uh, c'est des conversations tellement importantes. Uh, ce que je dirais avant de quitter, c'est, um, <coughs> I don't want to repeat everything Utara has already said, so I'll just leave you with, don't underestimate your role and the impact that you have on your team. And you often think that, oh, people are looking at the director general, looking for the DM or the ADM. But really, people think about your employees. They think about what you said to them. They go home. They think about it. What did she mean? What did he mean? Was he mad with me? Is he not happy with my performance? And so your impact on your team is so important. And don't, don't underestimate that. And I think in these times, it's even more uh, true. So I'll leave you with that. Merci. Merci. Et Jason, the dernier mot. So thank you. I, I know that. Um wanted me to talk a little bit about the baseline service. I'll end with a kind of a plug for uh, data, really like, you know, I learned a lot today from the session and I'm always, you know, I work in this field every day and I still learn every day from other colleagues or uh, every day or two, there's new articles coming out. So really uh, treat it as a learning exercise for yourself and be open to looking at these different perspectives and, um, you know, consider the data that we collect. And in terms of the Treasury Board hybrid in a box, it's a 
like I said, there's 11 departments participating and their results will be available, I believe in the, in the upcoming fall where there'll be a report. The, the survey itself won't be shared because it's part of a methodology, but the results will be shared uh, in the coming month or so or coming months. So I'm looking forward to reading it myself and then take stock of where you're at, you make your corrections, and then again, you just start at the new beginning. Voila. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason, Utra, Caroline, and thanks to all the participants uh, for your engagement and for providing questions to support this conversation. A reminder that there's more to come on this topic under the hybrid workplace series of events at the National Manager Symposium, and encourage you to visit the school's website to keep up to date and register for all future learning opportunities. Also a reminder that the recording of today's session will be made available in the days following the event. So if you were having to step away or if you wanna share this uh, with other colleagues, you'll have access to that. Thank you all very much. Un gros merci à tous et toutes. Passez une bonne journée.